we start with a simple question. What if? What if the events of the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis could be squeezed down into 13 hours? What if students from our time could step into the shoes of the decision makers in 1962? What if? Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. We need to get the missiles out. We had a problem. As of this moment, all military forces should stand up to DEFCON 3. Try to bring everything that should be mentioned is potentially illegal. It shall be the policy of this nation. Losses will probably be high. To regard any nuclear missile. There will be no more negotiations on this. Launch from Cuba. pretty bad things. As an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. February 24th, 2017. Students from 7th through 12th grades are arriving to sign in for a very special kind of project. If all goes according to plan, before the night is over, these students will be stepping back in time to 1962. For years, history teacher Heath Hamrick has been helping students bridge the gap between their present lives and the black and white past by running an annual simulation known as the Fences Project. From fascist Germany to the trenches of World War I, the project has followed the same basic structure. Students arrive in the evening to role play, and then as the night hours slowly pass, they slip out of the world they knew and into the recreated past. For most people, anything more than about 20 years in the past is just too far to really understand. Students need a bridge experience, something to help them connect with the past. October 1962. John Fitzgerald Kennedy is the youngest president of the United States ever elected by his fellow citizens. His White House is faced with the threat of the Soviet Union. Americans have watched a communist wall go up around the democratic bastion of West Berlin. They have watched as a faraway country called Vietnam has exploded in a war. And less than 90 miles from the coast of Florida, Americans have watched a communist dictator named Fidel Castro take power in Cuba. On the morning of October 16th, President Kennedy was notified that the Soviet Union had shipped nuclear missiles to Cuba. Initial estimates from the CIA gave the president two weeks until those missiles were fully operational. It's the quintessential Cold War problem. You have nuclear missiles in Cuba that you as president can't allow to remain there. At the same time, how do you make the Soviet Union remove them without starting a war? Back in 2017, the students are arriving to sign in and prepare for their roles in the project. They attend iUniversity Prep, a unique school operated by the Grapevine Colleyville Independent School District. iUniversity Prep is a virtual school where students from all over Texas can access their coursework at their own pace and the teachers can individualize each student's education. Completely operated by a public school district, iUniversity Prep is the cutting edge of education and the highest performing virtual school in the state. The Fences Project is right up this innovative school's alley. Some of the students arriving in Grapevine to participate in the crisis have driven for several hours and across the state to participate. They know they are in for 13 hours of intense role play, but most of them aren't quite sure what that will end up looking like. As they enter the cabinet room where the events of the night will play out, much of what is about to happen remains a mystery to them. 
As they enter and find their places, they have officially moved out of 2017 and into the tense morning hours of October 16, 1962. Thereafter, each hour that passes will represent a day in the Cuban Missile Crisis, a crisis that will begin when Hamrick enters as President Kennedy and teacher Neely Carter, role-playing as National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, briefs the entire room on the startling situation in Cuba. How is he doing? Back, late night. It is indeed, Mr. President. All right, let's have it. Mr. President, gentlemen, our analysis indicates that the Soviet Union has introduced surface-to-surface medium-range ballistic missiles. Our cities and military installations in the southeast, as far north as Washington, D.C., are in range of these weapons. Once armed and ready to fire, they could explode over Washington, D.C. in 13 minutes. In those 13 minutes, they could kill 80 million American people. I want a briefing from your group of options. Whatever they happen to be, that's what I need. Give me some options. I don't want to go off the deep end. I don't want to overreact, but I assume that we're going to be running out of time. So 745 on a briefing from all groups. We'll meet together right here. Thank you, gentlemen. Get to work. The room explodes into frenzied conversation. The project has truly begun. The directive for the next hour, prepare to brief the president on options to face this crisis. There were four subgroups that night. There was an intelligence group, which was made up of the CIA, the FBI, and deputies to the National Security Advisor. There was a military group, which was made up of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There was a diplomatic group, including the State Department and ambassadors to the UN. And finally, there was a political group, which included the attorney general, press secretaries, uh, political advisors. Each group is getting information unique to that group. Updates that were passed out by Elizabeth Miley, who was playing uh, Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln. What was really cool is about 90% of that material that they got all night was actual CIA or Defense Department documents that have been declassified in the years since. We just took that material and put it into our templates. And that was really awesome. They were really grappling with actual government documents. The documents and memos each group get are being distributed by a crew of devoted educators working behind the scenes. Lucas Birch, Jerry Price, Daniel Wennerstein, and Elizabeth and Kate Miley were responsible for filming the night's events, distributing materials at the appropriate times, and playing various roles throughout the night, including as the White House operator as students called from the cabinet room to convey orders or ask for information they didn't have. In the cabinet room, that information is fueling the intense discussions going on over what to do about the situation in Cuba. We are not actively going to the but if anything goes any farther, we may need another order. I was hoping that it would be serious and that we would get into actual policy, and we were just thrust into it. So we all sat down at the table, and we all kind of like looked at each other like, what did we get ourselves into? But, you know, you walked in as President Kennedy, and the first person you called on was politics and Secretary of State. And, I mean, I had prepared the materials, but I didn't realize what would be required of me. And it was really fun to just, like, fly off the seat of my pants, you know, work on what was going on, and really have to understand the material really fast. After perusing a CIA profile of Cuban dictator Fidel Castro, things look grim. My initial reactions was assignment, and then uh, I saw our first assignment. I saw our team, and I saw what we were going to have to do by the end of the first brief, and then my reaction was despair. 
But the uh, rush is going to continue shipping stuff over, so if we put a blockade and they can't send any over, and they make any attack to try and stop our blockade, that would be a declaration of war, in which case we could uh, have a full-arm assault. It shows a little bit of strength on our part, because we don't want to appear weak in this thing. One of the most immediate differences between 1962 and now is the willingness our students had to look for a solution that didn't include force. I mean, that kind of ingrained desire to avoid looking weak, which came naturally to government officials in the Cold War, you know, our kids didn't have that. Almost from the get-go, the idea of blockading Cuba to prevent more missiles from reaching the island while at the same time kind of leaving open the option of diplomacy, that was floated by the military group really early on. Where the 1962 XCOM was more hawkish, our students were more doves. The time has come for the XCOM to brief the president on the Cuban situation. It begins with the director of the CIA sharing the information he has on the missiles in Cuba. Uh, okay. What we know so far is that there are anywhere from uh, 16 to 20 of these SS-4 missiles positioned throughout Cuba. Uh, each of which uh, are not quite ready to fire, but when they are ready to fire, they will be ready to fire within 30 minutes of uh, full preparation. That means uh, getting them on the pad and launching, 30 minute time, very quick. From what we know, they're anti, basically anti-aircraft, anti-troop landings, anything that requires us offensively yeah, attacking them is going to be very uh, painful for us. Losses will probably be high. Unlike the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1962, the military advisors in the present-day XCOM recommend a blockade. So, what we came up with was a blockade plan. Suffocate them out because obviously the Soviet Union is still transporting stuff in. So, blockade, keep everything else out that the Soviet wants in and suffocate their economy. Take everything away from them. I'm not convinced a blockade doesn't get us into a further conflict. It's something I want to discuss. I want to know what Khrush how Khrushchev reacts to a blockade. The students' preparation for their roles comes into play. The State Department's expert on Russia gives his opinion on why Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the Soviet Union, has sanctioned the delivery of nuclear missiles to Cuba. Uh, my estimate is that he wants Poland. The uh, second estimate, second option for me, I would imagine, is he wants all missiles out of Tokyo. I mean, he wants both of them, I'm sure. I'm just, I st I'm pretty sure that Bolin is what he wants more. And imagine, imagine Rhode Island suddenly decided it was a communist state, and then the Soviet Union told us that if we invaded Rhode Island, then they would nuke us. Bolin is good. They don't like it. No decisions have been made, but there is plenty of work that needs to be done. So I'm Secretary of Defense, and I remember when I first got into the uh, the room, uh, you're like, okay, Secretary of Defense, what do you think? I'm like, oh, who's that? Oh, oh, it's me. <laughs> and so I had no idea what I actually said. I'm sorry if I messed up. So that was the moment I'm like, oh, this is real, and I'm actually doing something. And that was the first moment I'm like, okay, I really got to get into this. I got to think. The military is looking at options that include everything from a blockade to a commando raid on the missile sites. Over 3,000 feet will get caught on radar. Underneath, it might be visible from the sky. So if we went at night on a cloudy night with no, with, with no, with no lights, we could possibly get paratroopers into the sky. You need to play hardball with the Russians. I think yeah. for sure. One thing that definitely didn't happen in 1962 is a plan being cooked up by the political group and the attorney general to ease economic restrictions on Cuba in exchange for the removal of the missiles. But I haven't heard back from his rank or anything from the White House. What if, what if, I don't know if you the National Security Advisor makes the rounds, reminding the students to think ahead, to control events, to show forethought. We need to control the message and communicate a clear message to Khrushchev. The president has asked me to make sure you guys know that we have to have extreme control over what our response is going to be. I'm waiting. We want to eliminate all the variables that we possibly have. So if there's a very 
people out there. I know that it's the last brief. I don't know if these things are operational. I'm not trying to find these things out. That has to be done. I don't told the president to decline an order for the YouTuber to fly over. So what are our other options? What are we doing? Mr. Bundy? I forgot I had that. A meeting with Soviet foreign minister at 9.15. I bet he doesn't tell us about the missiles. I'm probably not going to tell him. I know. Meanwhile, the State Department prepares to brief the president on a meeting he is about to have with the visiting Soviet foreign minister. Will the existence of the missiles be revealed? Is this going to be a demand for a kind of ransom? The missiles in Cuba for West Berlin? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna go meet with the Soviet foreign minister. When I get back, we'll talk, I'll tell you what was said. I would like to hear basically any new items that have come up since we've had our last briefing. Mr. Bundy will be in charge, thank you. And so for the first hour, hour and a half, I was just thinking, that th this is happening. This is happening. And I just, I couldn't even say anything or just form proper words or <laughs> sentences because I was just in shock. Like, eventually the stress, it went into, let's work mode. Like, first I was panicking and just staring at everything and trying to comprehend what was going on. But then eventually I was like, okay, we need to work this out. And then it got better. And then worse. Yeah. And then also, we're still waiting on information on Germany and uh, what their intentions are. But this proves that they don't need to no. But that's not what he wants. What he wants but is those missiles out of Cuba. If, if you are. If you understand Che Guevara's brand of guerrilla warfare and how it functions in Cuba and how they overthrew the old Soviet regime, and you still believe that it's a good idea, you need to give me what I need to tell the international community. Not all of them, so like, but uh, four media people. Yeah, it's right here. Now in Western Cuba. All right, it's look right at that. That's very in detail for that. I don't even know which one. Right. His plan was like since there's yeah. 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 anything, any new updates they need. Regarding yeah. what? We don't care who it is. But we need a liaison. If we could not organize or focus on anything in specific, we would hit a conspiracy theory for the tiniest misinformation we would find. I mean, piece of information we would find. And Sean would say something brilliant but unrelated, <laughs> and we would be like, "Yes, let's. We gotta expand on this." Our, our guy in the KGB team. So if we're going to give uh, Fidel Castro false information about our capabilities, then we need to make sure that he'll believe it. So depending on the, uh, depending on like the rank and trustworthiness of our guy in the KGB, um, will depend on whether we can act on that plan. Now, this is one of those things that sounds like it came out of a spy novel and not real life, but this actually happened. We had a spy in Soviet military intelligence, the GRU, and that spy was codenamed Iron Bark. And all of our information on Soviet nuclear capability, their missiles, their hardware, it came from that source. Yeah, yeah. Soviet bases in Cuba. Those um, wait, 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 Cuba. wait. Were there launch sites that were Soviet? You told me a minute ago that there were Soviet ones. No. I didn't. He told you that. Right before the president returns from his meeting with the Soviet foreign minister, the intelligence group learns some disturbing info. Were they operational yet? Uh, uh, the missiles in Cuba are operational, yeah, and they can the shoot within 18 hours. In 18 days, or 18 hours in project time, the missiles in Cuba will become operational. Well, our experts at state called it. I talked to the Soviet foreign minister, Domenico. He did not mention anything about missiles in Cuba. I did read to him a statement I had made to the press several months ago just to 
ensure that the Soviets knew our policy, that we would not accept offensive weapons in Cuba. He said the Soviets understood, and to that statement, they had nothing to add. As far as I can tell, they still don't know that we know about the missiles. As the danger of the missiles being so close to the United States is discussed, the CIA director lays out a chilling warning. The presence of Cuba does have nuclear warheads ready to fire within 18 hours of the order given. Uh, that means that from the order given to, you know, launch 18 hours, uh, they are operational. But, I mean, we have no BMW warning system, which means we would have no warning these missiles were going to hit us until they were we right on the top sky. Of us. They're too close. The They're way too mm -hmm. close. Um, this, hold, hold up. What you're saying is that these missiles, if launched, and they are ready to be launched. 18 hours. Anywhere. From the order. 18 yeah. hours from the order. We will not even know that they have been launched until, until we, we see, see them, them in, the sky. in the sky. Yes. Mr. President, you're a pretty bad fix. You're all in it with me. <laughs> they, they, actually, they actually told Kennedy that. In real life, it was an Air Force General, Curtis LeMay, who says, you're in a pretty bad fix. And Kennedy shoots right back, well, you're in it with me. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. There's a famous photograph of Kennedy looking like the weight of the world is on his shoulders. It's called the loneliest job in the world. It's one of my favorite photographs. And you kind of start to feel that. To understand, you know, especially when the CIA is talking about the missiles hitting before you can even blink, you understand the weight of what not just the president, but everyone involved, the weight of what they had to deal with. And so the briefing continues. As the students inform the president about what they had been discussing, the economic carrot to Castro, the potential blockade, and even a potential mole in the CIA. Uh, problem number one would be that there is a leak within the CIA and we don't know who it is. Uh, within our CIA, there's, there's a CIA mole. We don't know specifically who. We've tried to figure out who it is and we can't find any of it strictly hard evidence that they room. exist, but there's no way to keep everything within the CIA on lockdown. It was never confirmed but a double agent did plant the suspicion that there was a highly placed Soviet spy in the Central Intelligence Agency, codenamed Sasha. And agents spent years, decades, looking for this mole, and they never turned up who it might be. I believe in the protection of the U.S. and its allies' interests. The U.S. should set up a blockade to stop importation of illegal contraband into the U.S. The blockade will search all ships coming into the North American seas by sending 10 to 15 minimally armed men onto each incoming ship. If anything is found on the ship, they will be arrested and charged with the appropriate crimes, and the USSR, in response to that, will be asked to disown them as an individual incident. And if they do not, this will be taken as a declaration of war. And Admiral, between now and the next briefing, give me some in-between. All right. Going with the blockade idea, I do agree that being avoiding violence as much as possible is a very, very good idea. Over here, Madam Attorney General. Why are they going to be okay with us committing their sons to a blockade that should be mentioned is potentially illegal uh, in the stance of international law? They're the, one of the longest standing laws in international law is the law of the sea. It states you only have jurisdiction over the 12 miles from your coastline. And as far as I know, we'll be breaking that law and we could potentially be alienating a lot of people in the UN by doing that. So I think it's worth reaching out to the countries that are surrounding Cuba. If we're going to do the blockade, I think that we can't be the only ones to do it. I think we would have to bring in Central American allies who are closer to their coasts and can help justify that because we will be in flat violation of the law. And by the end of it, I was getting pretty unfiltered. And I have to admit, I'm personally quite a dove, which is ironic considering both my parents are ex-military. But I, I'm a big dove, and so I was disagreeing with a lot of the policy decisions that were being made because um, I'm a big World Peace fan myself. The Attorney General in 1962 was Robert Kennedy, who might have morphed into a dove by the end of his life, but in 1962 he was really kind of a confrontational, aggressive figure in the XCOM. Um, our Attorney General is a student who is a teen advocate for human rights, and she brought that focus, that 
mentality to her role. So right about at this point in the night, our XCOM started to hear a lot more about international law than would have been discussed in 1962. And that really brought a different level to our discussions. We need to get the missiles out. That must happen. No matter what else happens, the missiles must be gone. A consensus, 11-15, I'll hear from all four groups, and then I will make a decision. The president has asked for a consensus opinion from all the groups, and once again, the discussion is intense. You know, and I was really surprised by the level of engagement throughout the entire night. Um, when I first saw this, I was really kind of skeptical. I was like, how oh, are you going to keep kids engaged for 12 hours and discussions, um, mostly with just written materials? And the kids really got engaged, and the team did a really good job of feeding the kids information that they had to make very important critical decisions on throughout the entire night. Raised for the first time is the possibility of foregoing military options altogether in favor of a trade. The Soviet missiles removed from Cuba for the removal of American missiles from Eastern Europe. We say, you know, we'll take them out of Hungary or whatever, but we'll work it out, right? It's just a scale. We take them out of Hungary, you take your missiles out of Cuba, nobody dies, the USSR doesn't look bad because they technically did what they said in public, which is, which is, you know, give them Marines, 12 14 days. Army, 14 to 20. Um, White House operator. Hello, this is Deputy Ambassador to the UN, uh, Niemeyer. Um, we're requesting information on Cuba's exports, uh, who is their biggest trade partner, what are the percentages, and just any information on their imports and exports. Thank you. Understood, thank you. Plan, right? So our plan is to like sort of destroy their economy and then help them rebuild it. Hard. If they're already trying to boost their economy at the moment, that would not be a good thing to hinder them at all because then that would just get them mad. Mm. Um, so there's another option on the table. Talking. We can make a press statement the same day that we talk to the UN General Assembly. In front of the UN General Assembly, we release all the information. We do an information splash. We say, look, the USSR has just invaded this tiny country that just had a communist revolution. They have put missiles on our back door. And at this point, we see that nuclear war is becoming more and more inevitable. Fidel is totally unstable. He says that he will always want to rebel. I think, honestly, the biggest achievement I had the entire night was getting the blockade. I mean, honestly, from the beginning there, it looked like it was not going to go through. Everyone was thinking about these other different plans. Now, I just like, this has to go. So, I mean, honestly, I think all the problems with the blockade plan are just not that crazy bad. I mean, we have ways to communicate with them. It's giving away to telling Russia, hey, we know what's going on. Everyone else knows that, hey, Russia is giving missiles to a country that wants to attack a fellow ally. So all these other countries then are going to be forced to do something about it and getting everyone on their toes. In the midst of hammering out a consensus, a call comes in for the press secretary, a reporter from the New York Times. Listen closely to what happens next. Hello? Hi, this is Catherine from the New York Times. I need to speak to the press secretary. This is the press secretary. Hi, um, I needed to go ahead and get um, a view, your view on the story that I'm writing. Um, it seems like there's a military exercise going down in Puerto Rico called right. Ortsac. Um, Castro is spelled backwards, of course, I'm sure you know. Um, it looks like this could potentially be a cover-up for an invasion, and I'm going to need to go ahead and get the administration's response. May I call back in five minutes? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. By uh, the New York Times, they said that there was a possible invasion from Mexico. That is the glory about being able to be in the Mexico. So the New York Times told us about a cover-up that Mexico could be invading the U.S. Did you just say Mexico? Yeah. Catherine from the New York Times called me and said that Mexico was going to invade uh, the U.S. It was months later that I actually pieced together what had happened. 
uh, it starts with a misunderstanding. When the reporter says that she has information on a military exercise that might be a cover for an invasion, she's talking about an American military exercise. What the press secretary thought she meant was that another nation was using a military exercise to cover up a potential invasion of the United States. And then in the stress of the moment, Puerto Rico became Mexico, and boom, you've got an invasion coming from Mexico. During the real Cuban Missile Crisis, reporters actually did sniff out what was going on. Uh, there was an American military exercise that was codenamed ORTSAC, which is Castro spelled backwards, and it was being used by the military as a cover for a potential invasion of Cuba if Kennedy had decided to go that route. Um, and, you know, mistakes do happen in real life because of pressure and stress, and those mistakes can have lasting repercussions, tiny mistakes, uh, and they happened in 1962. So when that same kind of thing happened in our 2017 crisis, what did we get? Well, well just for starters, the FBI director starts asking for wiretaps on the New York Times. That's how it starts. Hi, this is the FBI director, uh, as well as if we could put wiretaps on the New York Times and people with the New York Times to see where they necessarily got their information from. The briefing begins, and the president is given the options. Just as in 1962, there is no unanimous choice. My personal opinion is that we do the embargo and do not invade Cuba for any under any circumstances. Unless, By embargo, you mean blockade? Blockade, yes. Unless we unless nuclear missiles are launching in the air as we speak, we do not put troops in Cuba in Cuba or around Cuba. Thank you, sir. Some of us think the blockade's a good idea, but personally, I don't think either of them are. Considering the military invasion, how much time it takes to get each amount of troops and in and over there. Um, the blockade helps stop coming in, but it doesn't help the missile crisis that's already there. So I vote for diplomatic and figure that way. We are not looking to do any exchanges. We do not want to go to war with the Soviets unless it is completely necessary. Get support of not only the American people, but the people of Europe, possibly the people of Cuba, and manipulate the situation so that we look strong even if there's no clear winner. We believe that our best course of action is a diplomatic and economic solution. Um, from a legal perspective, the blockade, even if it's successful militarily, we risk damaging our international reputation pretty irreparably for the next few decades. And at the end of the day, I'd like to think that we're going to get past a nuclear holocaust and that that won't happen, and that we also need to keep in mind the reputation of our nation as a leader of the free world beyond this conflict. This is going to be my decision, and we'll implement it. We're going to do a two-phase option here. I want the military, especially the Navy, to prepare for a blockade of Cuba. I want to also prepare a carrot to Castro involving the lifting of economic sanctions if he removes the missiles. In tandem, they might work together. Castro will feel the pinch economically. At the same time, we've got a blockade. It looks strong. It might work in tandem. The decision had been made. The United States Navy will institute a blockade around Cuba to prevent any further missiles from the Soviet Union from reaching Cuban shores. Said that they, they might use a submarine to bypass the quarantine. There's got to be an invasion plan of Cuba that we've got on the shelf. I want to hear about it. The blockade doesn't work. The State Department goes to work on drafting two statements, one to the Organization of American States, asking for their support, and one to the Soviet leader, explaining the reasons for the blockade. It won't damage the ship at all, it will just 
If it's going to lead to war, that needs to come from me. So, I feel like we should discuss that with intelligence on what they know about. I mean, just kind of with all like the scrambling we were doing with trying to get like military to tell us what they were doing with getting paratroopers ready and how far along the blockade was, trying to get drafts written up to send out to the EU and NATO to talk about all the South American countries to see if we even could do a blockade. And then the press getting antsy because we hadn't even spoken to them for the better part of an hour. <laughs> that part, like, I was literally running to like four or five different tables every 10 seconds. And that part kind of, and then all of it just crashed at once. Ended up writing speeches on, like speed writing speeches. The political group is drafting too the all-important address Kennedy will make to the American people announcing the situation in Cuba and the blockade. I would especially make sure that you incorporate the director of the FBI because I know he's been really working on trying to make sure that we're kosher related. If we attack their sites, if we attack the missile sites, we're using their sites. Yes, this is the president. Please pass on an order. As of this moment, all military forces should stand up to DEFCON 3. Thank you. So far, the details have changed, but the end result is the same. A blockade or quarantine of Cuba. The military is on high alert. The American people are about to find out just how close we are to a nuclear war. And the Soviets know we know, and they know we have to do something about it. In real live 2017 time, it's past midnight, people are getting tired, the stakes are only getting higher, and the worst is yet to come. In 1962, President Kennedy revealed the Cuban situation to the nation in a televised address. In our cabinet room, the students gather to hear the president's speech. Mr. Bundy, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm about to start this address. You can pass on my compliments to the Attorney General, the Press Secretary, Communications Director, that staff. It's very well done. Fantastic. Mr. President, in five, four, three, two. Good evening, my fellow citizens. Today, we should get straight to the point. We have hard evidence that the Soviet Union has placed offensive nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba, approximately 90 miles from our shores. Your government will settle this situation with a quarantine. The quarantine will consist of an 800 mile perimeter around that imprisoned island. Our Navy will be stopping all ships carrying offensive weapons or other military contraband to Cuba from any nation. I have no doubt that this situation will be resolved. The price of freedom is always high. And Americans have always been willing to pay that price. One action we will never take is surrender. Have faith that your government will ensure that we, the American people, will always prosper. Thank you. And good night. The response to the president's speech is swift. The United Nations calls for an emergency session, and Fidel Castro is not intimidated. He just tripled, uh, Castro just tripled all of his forces, and basically he knows that something's up, and he thinks that we're bluffing. Army Castro's army is super loyal to him, so they're going to carry out his yes, mindset for a while. The blockade's in effect. I haven't got my Dominican Republic papers back. If you had to address every point that he's made so far, and you had to give just the most like, spot on evidence that it's wrong, what, what would you get? Like, what would make you believe something different? Think of somebody you admire right now, all the things that you think are great about them. What would somebody have to tell you to completely reverse that? And we could talk about lying. I was surprised to hear the idea of dropping leaflets on the Cuban people to try and undermine their support of Castro. And 
I was surprised not because it was a bad idea, but because it was something that was actually tried in 1962. The exact same idea. You can still see the leaflets that were worked up, and they are actually not too dissimilar from what our students came up with. And these students were coming up with this idea on their own, with, without any kind of prompting. I mean, that's, that's the greatness of a project like this. These kinds of, of little breakthroughs, the little details. The president encourages a well-deserved round of applause for the team that drafted his speech to the nation. Well, hopefully the American people think so too. Ladies and gentlemen, our situation as it stands. Then it is back to work. We have initiated our blockade of Cuba. We have prepared for that. Now we are in a standoff. The national security team has time before Soviet ships reach the blockade. But despite the president's address, the blockade doesn't have the wholehearted support of the group. We completely violated international law. Mm -hmm. We have no legal leg to stand on. Our only hope is if we can make a case that we were intervening to protect human rights interests. It's a very yeah. hard case to make. I'll take a legalistic catastrophe versus a nuclear one. However, if the Organization of American States votes to support us, it does recognize, the UN Charter does recognize an hemispheric right to defense. We could invoke that as a reason for our quarantine, that as a hemisphere, we are protecting ourselves. Also, I will not be the first president that violates the Monroe Doctrine. As Soviet ships steam towards the blockade line, the XCOM continued to work full steam on the details of the quarantine. If we then what can we consider initiating war? If a direct attack upon the ship. The State Department dives into the complicated task of preparing a briefing for American Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson. It will be Stevenson who has to convince the world that America is right. The students need to present a solid case if American actions are going to be seen as justified. There's also this thing called customary law. It's something that can be established for decades of operating this specific place. We're having copies of the Monroe Doctrine printed off right now. We can argue that it's customary law. We can assume that our allies in the hemisphere are going to agree with us. That's going to give us the best legal standing. Then, in the middle of the crisis, a series of unexpected and frightening events unfolded. We had a problem. An F-106 crashed. No Wait, this plane is carrying a nuclear warhead? And we don't know if it's going to explode. Get on no. that, find out. I want to know how the pilot is. I want to know if Indiana is going to explode because of a crash. At about this time, the United States had gone to DEFCON 2 which is the readiness condition right before all-out war. And as part of that order, our fighter interceptors were loaded with nuclear-tipped missiles, and then they were scattered to different airfields. And the basic idea was that they could intercept any inbound Soviet bomber and knock them out of the sky with a nuclear airburst. Okay, one of those interceptors actually crashes and burns in 1962 with the nuclear warhead. What happens if a nuclear explosion goes off in the continental United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis? You tell me. One of those F-106s just crashed on landing. Plane is ablaze. We don't know the condition of the pilot or the condition of the nuclear warhead in that plane. The Joint Chiefs are working on it. Keep that in your mind. If an explosion goes off in Indiana, how are the Soviets going to respond? Lambert was arrested and we fear that he gave us false information from the KGB and we're reviewing his body. Seriously, this isn't my money. I imagine the rough thing about being a spy is that everyone is looking to catch you. And just as the blockade is announced, the American agent in the Soviet GRU, Ironbark, he's arrested by the KGB and then executed. If nothing else, this drives home the fact that this isn't a crisis of words alone. 
there are very real, very personal dangers involved. You know, fortunately, the pilot in the F-106 crash survived, and the nuke his plane is carrying doesn't ignite. So, you know, at least there's that. Alive and uninjured. And I assume he's uninjured. And you trust him that the nuclear warhead has not been compromised and has been secured by the SIC forces. 2 a.m. has come and gone. Tensions are rising with the stress. A group that at first advocated measured, nonviolent solutions to the crisis are starting to advocate for more forceful measures. All right, so we have an intelligence report. I'm just going to read it because it's fairly short. According to latest intelligence information, 22 Soviet ships are headed for Cuba, including several suspected of carrying missiles. Many of the ships are receiving urgent radio messages from Moscow in unbreakable code. The Soviet submarine appears to be stationed between Yuri Gargan and the quarantine line. This appears to be diesel field Foxtrot class submarine. Also, I think I think he is doing the same thing you are doing. I think he's thinking the exact same way of he knows about this international law. He's brought it up. He's thinking, if I can get them to shoot on me, I can I can win this. So it might be a playing chicken. Playing chicken to an extent, but neither one will fire. It might it might be y'all are on one side, he's on the other, and nothing happens because mm -hmm. unless you get him to force his hand at one of us has to blink first. Mm -hmm. All right, Commandant. Uh, we have discovered ev the coordinates of every single SAM site inside of Cuba. And at any moment, we can organize uh, an air raid that would take care of every single SAM site by next briefing if you wanted us to. We could prepare. Admiral? Um, going with your uh, uh, analogy of who blinks first, I honestly think uh, Russia has duct taped their eyes open. Every move they've made, we've been reacting to. They've done something we've been reacting to. Um, so I mean, I think honestly, we've been at war this whole time, it's just no one's actually shot a bullet yet. And I think the time the first bullet shoots is in two days when those uh, ships meet each other. I think we need to start uh, thinking ahead to possible uh, strategies to come in on top. <laughs> well, that's more bad news. Uh, yes, we do actually. We have identified several ships coming towards the blockade. Uh, what's important about these images is that it shows that they are carrying contraband in fact and there's no way of hiding it. Um, this ship you see here, we do not have a name for it, but it is carrying uh, military personnel on the front and military vehicles. As you can see, it's in the circles if you want to pass those around. Uh, I think that's another copy of the same one under that, so you can... The that's next that. image shows a uh, almost tanker-like ship that is carrying an abundance of military uh, personnel. Admiral, what was the Potava carrying? So I've got a picture of it here. What was it carrying? This is our intelligence. Pass these around. Wrong one. Uh, carrying missiles to Cuba. Uh, we have the Grozny on there. G R O Z N Y. What's she carrying? Um, loaded with suspected missiles fueling equipment. That would be yeah, on station two as well. That would make sense from here. I'll pass these around. News interrupts the briefing. The Organization of American States has taken a vote on whether or not to support the blockade. One, because of the offensive nature of the weapons in Cuba, the United States has asked that member nations of the Organization of American States vote on a resolution to approve the quarantine of that nation. Submitted to a vote, the resolution was approved by the 18 favorable votes that the call was approved unanimously. Okay, you can all clap now, because that's a good. For once, the news is good. The OAS has voted to support the American blockade. Okay. Now, the president asks for a briefing on what the State Department plans on telling Ambassador Adlai Stevenson in preparation for the emergency session of the UN. Ambassador Stevenson, this is the president. I have here my uh, diplomatic group, including the Secretary of State and the Attorney General. They're going to brief you on what we'd like you to say to the UN. The time for preparation is over. Hello, Ambassador Stevenson. This is the Secretary of State. We're here to brief you on your UN hearing. 
We're going to the State Department gathers under the leadership of the Secretary of State to brief Adelaide Stevenson. And I just loved being at the wall and brainstorming with our team, talking about like real policy. And when we were done, I was in my power heels, right? And I, we would march as a team across the um, carpet to the phone and we would put it on speaker. And then in the end, when I had a talk on the for the treaty, because I, I kind of like a dream of like doing this. It's like I saw, I've seen a lot of pictures of like the presidents like leaning against their desk with their phone. And so I was like leaning against the desk with the phone on the phone with the ambassador. And I was like, my dreams are coming true. <laughs> so yeah, I just felt like trying to create it was so satisfying to come together as a team and create something and walk across the seal in your power heels. Okay, thank you for calling. I will take care of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy has left for the flag plot at the Pentagon, where he can report firsthand on the Soviet ships expected to run the blockade line. Will the ship submit to American inspection? Or will American and Soviet sailors die to carry out the foreign policies of their respected governments? Ladies and gentlemen, keep it down. I'm going to put it on speaker. Thank you. Mr. President, I'm at the flag plot of the Pentagon. I have a note just handed to me. We've just received information that all six Soviet ships currently identified in Cuban waters, and I don't know what that means, have either stopped or reversed course. Let me say again, Mac. The Soviet ships approaching the line have stopped or turned around. Their clarification is coming in right now. Soviet ships suspected of carrying offensive material seem to have reversed course at some point during the last few hours. We were eyeball to eyeball, and I think the other guy just blinked. Congratulations, sir. All right. This doesn't end things. It just pushes One off. test has been passed. Soviet ships have turned around, and a confrontation along the blockade line has been avoided. The president will need to communicate this small victory to the American people, and so the political group sets to work drafting yet another speech. As a deputy press secretary, the part that really like struck to me that I was like, wow, I can actually do something here. Um, we were working on we were working on the um, speech for you, and we kind of had a rough draft, and you were like, no, 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 you had us fix all this stuff. And I was like, oh crap, we have like three minutes. So I threw it all together, and you made some revisions, but overall I think I did pretty well on that, and that's where I was like, I can actually do things here. And Mr. President, in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, my fellow Americans. I come to you tonight bearing good news. When approaching our quarantine line, the Soviet ships reversed course. They are presently heading back to the Soviet Union. Their cargoes of offensive weapons undelivered. This is a victory for peace and stability. We send great thanks to our allies at the Organization of American States and across this great hemisphere. We have provided a united front towards this crisis. We commend Secretary Khrushchev on his decision. We have heard the cries of nations and people across the world imploring us to seek peace. And today, we are one step closer to that peace. Thank you, my fellow citizens, and good night. As hopeful as the tone of this second national address is, the people in the room know that the situation remains as dangerous as ever. The Soviet missiles are still in Cuba, still aimed at the United States, and time is running out to avoid a war. And then word comes from Cuba an ominous sign that the Soviet Union is not as eager to find a peaceful solution. The nuclear missiles have been readied for launch. 
fueled and aimed an address rehearsal of a potential attack on the United States. Intercepted radio traffic suggests that Soviet forces in Cuba used the cover of darkness last night to conduct a dress rehearsal, rehearsal for, for the firing of their nuclear missiles. Missiles were erected, targeting cards were inserted, and missiles were prepared for fueling. It is at this point when the danger of war is at its height that the representatives from the intelligence group raises the possibility of making a trade. Uh, personally, the only options I see we ha us having uh, are either to hold on to this embargo until some deal can be made or to really just immediately make a trade with the Soviet Union as to how we can get these missiles out of Cuba as quickly as possible just basically with the classic spy trade, you know, you give him, you give, you give us this guy back and we'll give you this guy back. Look, we'll get our missiles out of here. If you take your missiles out of here, compromise where you can, you know, stand fast where you have to. And in this situation, we have to compromise. It's not compromise where you can, it's- A call comes hey. in. The time has come for Adlai Stevenson, the American representative to the United Nations, to lay out the American case for the world. Much will hinge on the next few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, I believe we are ready. Go ahead and patch us into that feed. All right, beginning now. Let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed an in-spacing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? Я не нахожусь в американском суде, и поэтому не, не хочу отвечать на вопрос, который задается в прокурорском плане. Put to me in the fashion in which a prosecutor does. In due course, sir, you will have your reply. You're in the court of world opinion right now, and you can answer yes or no. You have denied that they exist. I want to know if you, if this, if I've understood you correctly. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. And I'm also prepared to present the evidence in this room. <laughs> which you can all examine at your leisure. Shows three successive photographic enlargements of another missile base of the same type in the area of San Cristobal. These enlarged photographs clearly show six of these missiles on trailers and three erected. And that is only one example of the first type of ballistic missile installation in Cuba. I loved using the actual audio of that UN meeting. And not just for the drama of it, though you can't write a better script for that confrontation, not if you try. Um, before Adlai Stevenson goes before the UN, world opinion was actually pretty firmly against the United States. The consensus was basically that the United States was either making up the issue or greatly exaggerating in order to force some kind of military confrontation over Cuba or justify it. Um, there was a lot riding on this meeting that most students, most Americans, never even think about. Um, we just kind of assume that everyone thought Americans were the good guys, obviously. It actually took Adlai Stevenson to really make our case before the world. Within the next hour, we're going to have to make our final choices. It seems to me that we have won every step along the path that we have taken, except the final victory, which is getting the missiles out of Cuba. Every step of the way, you have won. At this point, everything is interpreted in the light of the crisis. What does this action signal? 
What do those words mean? What kind of intent can we discern from this bit of intelligence? When it says Everything carries a heavier weight, a deeper meaning. We are reminded of Mr. Bundy's earlier warnings to the groups to control the message as news comes in that a previously scheduled American atomic bomb test has proceeded. What this nuclear explosion will signal to the Soviets is anyone's guess. Why did someone not think this would be relevant? Everyone in the room expects an explosion at any minute. But the kind of bombshell they get is not what anyone expected. An American reporter has been approached by a KGB spy with an offer for the U.S. government. Open to a deal where they take out all kinds of weapons. Wait, what is this coming from? Why is there an ABC News reporter? Where they remove all offensive missiles in return for us taking them to the The president wants us to find out if it's a boy, because they make no mention of Turkey or Berlin in this. And that was really a best case scenario if we can get out of this with them just removing the missiles and us not having to change our. For the longest time, the accepted narrative of the Cuban Missile Crisis includes the idea that Khrushchev floated a secret deal to JFK via this KGB agent, via this reporter, John Scally. Almost every film on this event is going to include this Scully deal as a kind of climax. The problem with that is that this narrative is wrong. Uh, according to most modern historians, the narrative is just wrong. Uh, the KGB agent is actually using his contact with this reporter, who he knows has contacts in the Kennedy administration, to he's dangling this deal to just try and shake loose some intelligence on what the Americans are really thinking. Uh, Khrushchev didn't authorize and didn't even know about this deal being offered until later. Um, it's actually a coincidence that he sends this letter uh, opening up the possibility of a deal. Um, that's just coincidence that it comes through about at the same time that the Scali deal is coming before the Kennedy administration. But it served to reinforce the American viewpoint that the, the Scali deal was legitimate. And I try to treat it exactly as Kennedy did, as a legitimate offer. Yeah, Wait, so they're just gonna quit? As far as we take down the project, talk to the intelligence. We don't know if it's real or not. Uh, Khrushchev sent a letter to you about this, and he didn't state outright, but he did open up an option saying that the Soviet Union would be interested in mutual discontinuing of armaments. Ms. Pink Staff? The mood in the room has lightened over the potential deal floated by reporter John Scally. The students had been talking about making a deal involving trading the missiles in Cuba for American missiles in Turkey. The deal offered through Scali doesn't mention American missiles at all, focusing instead on removal of Cuban missiles in exchange for a pledge from the United States not to invade Cuba in the future. A much better deal for the United States, and the first sign that the crisis might end in a complete American victory. The light mood does not last long. So basically, they've taken over the military. The and Cuban military? Yeah. They're running everything. Now. Soviet personnel have replaced Cuban ones in charge of the missile batteries, air defense sites, and military command. 
The Secretary of State has also received a communique from Khrushchev that offers a deal significantly different than the one put forth through reporter John Scally. He will accept if we withdraw offensive weapons. He will withdraw offensive weapons from Cuba if the United States withdraws our rockets from Turkey. No. Wait, that's not the deal we offer. Yeah. No, but it's the deal he countered. Don't take it. Why not? Because he's he's now on his heels. He's like falling backwards. We've got the whole world on our side. No. We've got the advantage, no. and he can't. He now can't come in here and strong arm us with yeah. nothing. You can counter and say yes to this too. You can ask for something else. Trust him. Nothing. No. Exactly. Just say no. Then why should we take his offer? If he's gonna why? The misunderstandings about the Soviet willingness to deal is having repercussions on the students. Some still advocate for a direct trade, missiles for missiles. Many, however, are pressing for a more forceful approach. He can't realize, oh, I can't do this anymore. They're winning. And they're like, oh, let me take this little peace deal. And then once we accept it, he makes it big all. Are we really going to let him get away with this? I am going to stick by what I've been saying for the last hour. The Jupiter missiles in Turkey are obsolete. I can accept that deal if that deal never becomes public. He cannot get that victory. Figure out how to make that work, ma'am. And so when I finally got to um, address the public relations thing and bring up, you know, are we cat and mice or are we men? That was kind of like the moment for me where I just totally gave in to all of my criticism <laughs> to kind of let it fly and just kind of forgot, like, this is a simulation. Could it be possible for us to go completely the different direction and use this as a jumping off point to start talks? Because otherwise, this entire situation has just been a drop in the bucket in an ocean of Cold War antics that have been going on for how long now? How long is this realistically sustainable? How long are we going to play these games and remain cat and mice before we realize that <laughs> until we're men and start talking to each other like human beings, this situation isn't going to de-escalate. We have a chance here to go public, talk to the UN, bring other nations in, and try to bring peace. In a movie, this is the point where the music rises triumphantly and people start crying. Um, in the real life 1962, the same kind of things were happening as far as the push to respond as aggressively as possible. And it was Robert Kennedy and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara who really spoke out for maintaining a level-headed approach, um, holding out hope for a peaceful solution. Um, for us, it was the Attorney General who countered the, the rising sense that war was inevitable with what we later affectionately dubbed the cat and mice speech. Well, let's do this. Part of our initial offer was a pledge never to invade Cuba. Let's make that public. When we, when we go public with this deal, let's make that part public. Then let's see if we can get a nuclear weapons summit. Not just ourselves and the Russians, but representatives from the OAS, representatives from the UN, let us. Let's do it. If he accepts, but maybe that is how we couch it in a message to him with our counter offer. Maybe we hide the fact that Turkey can't be a direct quid pro quo by also mentioning, let's put the pressure on him. Let's put world peace on him. We will not invade Cuba. We will make that pledge public on the floor of the United Nations. We will end the economic blockade. We will send immediate humanitarian relief. They've been suffering for quite a while. Let's do that. Let's call for the summit. Throw all that out there. At the end of the message, we can say, if these terms are acceptable a year from now, we can remove the missiles from Turkey with the caveat that that deal is not made public. Put it at the end. Despite the Attorney General's plea, it is not at all clear that peace will win the day. Events escalate, and the chance of a mistake or a misunderstanding leading to nuclear war increases with every moment. And I have another one too.
Soviet nuclear tests up in Antarctica. So, right now. Soviets have now taken over Cuba for whole world. No, no, they powered up their weapons. That's what this is. No, but they switched. Right. We still know where they are. They're basically saying, we don't trust the Americans just like we don't trust them. Now, Attorney General. Um, YouTube flight pilot about Major Rudolph Anderson has failed to check in. Flight plan called for Anderson to fly within a range of eight SAM sites at an altitude of 72,000 feet. Analysis is that his uh, his airplane was shot down by Soviet man SAM site in Cuba. The 13th day, the last day is always seen as the high point of the crisis. That point where all of us being turned into atoms bouncing around the stratosphere, that seemed like the most likely possibility. When Major Anderson's U-2 flight was shot down over Cuba, that was the moment the situation was closest to everything just heading south. At the time, Kennedy resisted the almost, it was almost a unanimous urging from his military advisors to, to strike back. And I did likewise, um, but the cumulative effects of all the, the various misunderstandings and mistakes, um, they were really having an impact. In that room, there were a good number of people who, who saw a military strike as increasingly inevitable. You know, we were talking about making a missile for missile trade, but there was real resistance to that. Real resistance, not feigned academic resistance real gut-level emotional resistance. Right thing here, not to overreact, defuse so, this situation if we can. So one of the terms of this deal that we have is that the Soviet Union would agree to go to a peace talk conference about negotiating a nuclear test ban. In 1962, the crisis was resolved with the same kind of missile-for-missile missile deal that we had been discussing all night, uh, with the caveat that the Soviets couldn't reveal the details of the deal publicly. I mean, as far as the world was concerned, they withdrew the missiles in Cuba in exchange for a pledge from the United States to respect the Castro government. That deal was offered in a kind of ultimatum by Robert Kennedy to the Soviet ambassador. You know, he basically said, look, this is the deal. You need to accept it by tomorrow or else we're going to war. For us, that ultimatum was delivered by our, our Russian expert with the State Department. And that moment was just, it was just a great moment. That, that was the climax of the night, as far as I was concerned. Hello, this is Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia. I'd like to speak with Ambassador Darwinin, please. Uh, you know, as you know, the United States, the President has just very graciously passed along a suggestion, a suggestion for a way we can resolve this little conflict through the Secretary of State. But I just, I'm just going to say, you, throughout this whole little fiasco, have always insisted that you're doing all of this in the name of peace, of well, peace in Cuba specifically, and world peace on a greater scale. I'm just calling to let you know. That this is, if you really want world peace, this is your chance. There will be no more. We, there will be no more negotiations on this. If you want peace, you will accept this offer. Perfect. Well done. There is a final moment of tension. One last twitch. One last threat of nuclear holocaust. Well, there are multiple things I would do different, but that, the biggest one I would do different is that in the beginning. We were more scrambling for raw facts than we were for uh, the basic things like, you know, how are they getting all these ships? One moment. Sir, Mr. President, just got this in. Uh, the North American uh, Air Defense Command in Colorado Springs has issued this saying that the air defense radar has picked up evidence of an unexplained missile launch from the Gulf of Mexico. The trajectory suggests that the target is somewhere in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Reactions? Wait, just one? Not even the Russians have it that in for Tampa Bay. Thoughts? I'm not making this up. I swear. This actually happened.
I mean, it seems like we're pushing the drama just a bit too much, just to just to, to throw in another scare. But uh, no, this this actually happens. <laughs> Pulse alarm. Notice that this one who holds next to target on Tampa, Florida is a false alarm. After 13 hours, the wait is over. A communique comes in from the Soviet premier, either accepting the deal and ending the crisis, or turning it down and pushing the world into nuclear war. Before everyone left the project, we all signed a poster, and it had a simple statement. We survived. As an educator, it had been an amazing night. I mean, watching my students, they really dived into these problems that they were faced with. They, they embraced their roles. And, you know, going into it, I had my doubts about how engaging a 13-hour, academically-centered, dialogue-based role-play could be. And my students consistently surprised me all night long. They argued, they disagreed, they analyzed, they schemed, and even when they were getting tired, they were getting tired in October of 1962 instead of February of 2017. And that was the whole point. What kind of a peace do I mean and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal.